Hello and welcome to FS Brew. FS Brew is the region's first podcast focusing on all things insurance and insure tech here in the UAE and the wider Middle East. I'm Vidya. I'm the founder of Forward, a startup that works with insurance companies to accelerate their go-to-market propositions, digital transformation, and digital marketing initiatives. And I'm Ranjit Philip. I'm an angel investor and advise and work with startups. These days, I'm working to set up the Middle East business of a cyber insure tech called Box Insurance. And today, we are meeting Vaibhav and Javed from Velex AI. Velex AI is the first of its kind wellness health insurance platform that rewards its users for leading a healthy lifestyle and gives back in terms of their premiums. So Vaibhav Kashyap is the co-founder and CEO of Velex. Uh, Vaibhav is an MBA from INSEAD and a Bachelor of Science in Insurance from the Ohio State University. And he comes armed with an extensive experience in the insurance space spanning over 10 years. And Javed is an accomplished financial services professional. He's the co-founder and managing director of Velex. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from the Southern New Hampshire University. I quite enjoyed this whole conversation between the two. The chemistry was quite palpable between them, and they seem to be uh, really working towards building a cutting-edge health insure tech proposition for this market. Ranjit? Yeah, absolutely. First of its kind in this region homegrown. And I like their focus on uh, building an ecosystem as a whole, uh, which is really right from mental health to physical uh, wellness uh, and everything in between. So Vaibhav and uh, Javed, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you with us here. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, Very much great to be here. So thank you so much for inviting us. Great. Awesome. So this is a question we ask all our guests. How did you guys get into insurance? And can you please tell us why did you go about setting up Velex? You want to go first? No, no, you go first. <laughs> so I was born to insurance, um, as as uh, I think with their so are you. Um, and it, it it like it tends to be that uh, it's an industry that's not perceived as very interesting or sexy from the outside, but uh, but if you're surrounded by it, it does have its uh, have its appeal. Why we set up Velex? Um, yeah. I think one of the one of the challenges you face being in the insurance industry is you tell anybody else who's not in insurance, you work in insurance, they kind of give you this big <sighs> sigh, right? Like, oh my God, how disappointing. Um, and I think uh, I personally believe that the industry is meant to provide that peace of mind, security, and care for its customers that you know, that we all talk about. And uh, the what drove us to build Velex was to to be, make that a reality, right? To to build something that really does make people happy, add value on a day to day basis, and doesn't let people feel that they're being uh, cheated or mistreated or taken advantage of in any way or form. Um, and so that's one of the key reasons why we set up Velex. Nice. Okay. And and when I first met him, that's the si- same side that I I had to you know he's like I'm a, I'm a, I was born in a family of insurance. I'm like oh no, <laughs> what am I getting into? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think one of the reasons why, why, why I am where I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing is so that we can take that sigh away, right? It's, um, it's an industry that's been, um, like you mentioned earlier on, um, it's, it's so heavily guarded by so many different gatekeepers and there's so, many, so, much, so much different terminology that's thrown around that the end user, the customer, has lost all sorts of control of how it is that they um, engage with their product. And, and uh, something that's always driven me is in how we can make uh, people change their everyday lives um, and the financial services space is one that I very much believe in having spent uh, a bit, the better part of my professional career 18 years in the banking space um, a space in which um, you know technology and, and change and transformation has very recently um, come full throttle um, I was lucky enough to be part of the initial uh, digital teams um, within the bank that that saw those crazy experiences coming to the world of banking, and, and I, f- I feel like this this industry, the, the insurance industry, is primed for for that transformation or for that change. And we're we're on ground zero right now of building some magical experiences in the space of insurance. So um, this is why I'm here to change the world. One point. Good. Yet. <laughs> no, that, that that's good. That's excellent. Uh, good to see uh, sort of different uh, points of attack into the insurance industry. And the thing is, once you get into it, you start to like it, and you feel, hey, I should have been in this industry. Um, now, stepping uh, sort of uh, back and thinking through, th- we like the ideation process, you know, uh, when the startup is kind of created, what were the sort of the first steps 
uh, that you both took to start the business? Who, who's, uh, you know, who met whom and what happened? It's good to know the background, you know, it's always interesting. Cool, so, um, so I, I used to be a fat kid. Um, and so I used to tell my mom that I'm going to grow up and have a gym. And that's going to have a health food restaurant associated with it. And we're going to, you know, make people fitter and healthier. Because uh, I didn't feel like I had that infrastructure growing up. And then, of course, growing up in insurance, we sort of went down the insurance path. And was trying to figure out how do we marry the two. And there's, it's a proven business model in other parts of the world, shown to reduce healthcare costs, proven to make people healthier. And Middle East is sort of the right place, right, for, for it, given that we live sort of relatively sedentary lives. So I had a rough, rough understanding of what, of what uh, we wanted to do. Um, and I think meeting Javed really helped crystallize that into something that's an actionable plan. Um, his experience was invaluable in terms of uh, he's done a few startups before and sort of been in sort of very senior and key positions. So it's been, uh, it's been a great, great team effort getting the product uh, to where it is today and uh, continuing it on from there. Right, right. So uh, do I take it that Weber, you are handling the business side and Javed is a product or how is the sort of- so I'm, more, I'm, I'm more product uh, and, and more. Javed. Yeah. Okay, got it. Perfect, perfect. Nice. I mean, it, it slips in quite nicely to my next question, actually, to you both. You know, the whole co-founder relationship is quite critical for startups. And we know from data that many startups fail if this is not done well. Now, did you both take a very conscious to, you know, look to avoid such issues? What did you guys do uh, to make sure such a, you know, so, so those issues don't come about? Um, how did you go about agreeing on the roles of what each of you will do as co-founders? If you can talk through, uh, those would be great. Yeah, I think uh, a good question, and you're right, it, it feeds right in from the previous question. It, look, we complement each other quite well. You know, you've got the corporate sort of back, backdrop of 18 years, very strategic view, somebody who understands the industry um, at the depths at which uh, Weber does it, it kind of fits in well. Um, I think when it comes to co it's, it's sort of like any relationship, it has to come very naturally and has to um, uh, be organic in the way that it evolves. Um, now, having spent the last many months with Weber, it, it seems like um, it, it's almost like, you know, where I leave off is where he starts off and where he start, where leaves off is where I'm able to continue on from. Um, I feel like if you're aligned on the ultimate objective, right, which is doing something crazy, which is trying to change the world, um, and you're able to come to terms with the fact that you both want it to happen, the journey, while exciting, can also be very taxing, tiring, exhausting, um, but fun at the same time. And you, you can have all sorts of disputes, arguments, and we fight all day long, right? Um, this guy wants to get married to everyone that he meets. Um, I very strongly oppose marriage. So, you know, with, with that particular um, thing, thing said, it, it, it sort of gives you a good balance in how you handle your day-to-day, -day, but yeah. with that ultimate objective of being able to get to where you want to get at, right? We're very, very stubborn on that ultimate objective, but we're very flexible in how we get there. Um, the one yeah. thing that I think really brings us together is neither one of us is afraid to fail, but more importantly, is afraid to call a fail a fail so that we can pivot and move on from it. Um, and I think if you have these two sort of um, things plugged in right from the get go, everything then becomes about how do you get to the next step, right? And if you can get to that place in a relationship, um, I think uh, you've got something interesting um, happening. Nice. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Vidya, you're going to ask something? No, I was just going to say, I believe uh, finding a co-founder is it's almost like dating. Uh, so it's an interesting Yeah, analogy. just to clarify, the marriage point was, was to do with business relationships and not actually getting married. This <laughs> you, can, you can censor that out of, out, of, out of the interview because his wife might divorce him, I don't know. <laughs> my, you know, my I mean, that's because I'm in Dubai all the time and she's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just tells you, you know, that, you know, it is a meeting of the minds, right? You have to be aligned yeah. very much. Yeah. 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 So, so, uh, is one of the most important things in the situation. Correct. Right? correct. Both Absolutely. Of us are very flexible in terms of what we want and what we need and how we achieve our end target. So that, that, that's, yeah. that's been our best yeah. aspect, I think. And look, the journey, the journey ahead, I think, is going to be a lot more um, grueling, right? And um, we're, like I said, at the at that sort of honeymoon phase where we're building the product, excited to sign up partnerships, get people engaged, getting people excited about what we're able to achieve. 
Um, it's when you is when the build, business starts to get built around is when you'll get real testimony to this relationship. Yeah. But if it gets off to a good start, then you know you're you're on the right track. True. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so that was the you know co-founder piece, and uh, the other important piece is obviously the business model. We have seen uh, in some cases, you know, uh, businesses which just look at you know gathering customers at all costs, and then you know when they uh, the business uh, tide turns, you know, you realize that, you know, it's it's not a viable business. So uh, we want to dig a little bit into the business model, if you don't mind. And it's a, a, a great example of homegrown in short tech. So we are all eager to know sort of what are the core components of the business model? Uh, and, uh, you know, how do you monetize if you're happy to share that? Uh, we'll be good to know. Yeah, sure. So I think, um... Well, first of all, our, our core concept is that we, we want to be selling health, right? So selling the concept of being healthy versus the concept of we'll pay when you fall sick. So that does change the approach a little bit in terms of, in, in just in terms of how, how we target our customers and in terms of how you structure the product, because there is a large wellness component to it. And so effectively, we're not just selling insurance, we're also selling wellness, right? So the market, if you think about it, it's two markets that we're, that we're catering to. Then on, on, on top of that, I think, just as you said, there's, there's loads of companies, startups, you've seen what's happening currently uh, in the US with the stock, with all the insure techs getting beaten up 90%. It's yeah. not right? just insure techs, it's everybody. It's right? everybody, but insure techs specifically have really, really taken a hit, right? Um, and I think that's to do with the fact that Look, custom acquisition at all costs, uh, including uh, losing underwriting profitability, uh, is is something that is is, a, is something that is definitely an issue and concern, especially with the companies that went the sort of full stack carrier route. From our perspective, what we we very much believe in making very many incremental and small wins. And so what 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 we've done is is taken is focus on the product being it profitable in itself, right? Because in general. Yes, there's years people companies don't make money, but in general, the insurance insurers are making money, right? And what we're doing is augmenting that to for, to build upon that to then focus on improving the levels of profitability instead of coming in with a product that completely is you know is reliant on uh, aggressive assumptions that that are yet to be proven, right? So from that perspective, I mean, we our product is quite safe on the health insurance front. But the uniqueness with the wellness aspect is what makes it uh, what what makes it different, and uh, that's how that's how we built the business model. So you know, in the so first, if I get one of our partners, um, uh, which we engaged with very early on, uh, one of the first companies that actually subscribed to the concept, he told us, um, "Go out there, and get me rich, healthy, young customers." Right. Right. And so when we set out uh, and we created the concept, we realized. Customers that are fit will self-select into this concept because mm-hmm. it's a it's a wellness back proposition, right? And yeah. if I care for my wellness, I'm going to buy into this proposition. So by default, what we're doing is we have we're privileged to be in a position where we can sort of start from scratch, which no insurer has um, that sort of leverage right now, that 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 ability. And so we're able to start in a place where we only attract good risk. You know, um, and we can pick and choose the risk that we bring on on onto the um, onto the platform, um, which gives you longevity in this space. So it gives you the ability to then experiment and do so much more um, with your customer base. Right. Uh, so so just to clarify for our uh, listeners, I mean, this is a, a health insurance add-on which uh, gives you know, depending on your behaviors, you get a better rate uh, uh, and benefits around it. I mean, is that? Yeah, exactly. So, well, it's a it's a health insurance product in itself, um, uh, and yeah, yeah, but exactly, exactly as you mentioned, the the healthier somebody behaves, the more, and it's a it's a lot about behavior and commitment to bettering one's one's lifestyle effectively, right? So we're not we're not saying that we want somebody of this age or this BMI or whatever like that. What what we do want is somebody committing to improving their life in whatever way or form they can cons- constitute as wellness and that could be mental physical just taking steps eating healthy any of those things um, as long as they do a little bit more than they were yesterday uh, that's good enough for us so it's an entire proposition if i if i was to break it down a little bit further into more simpler steps right 
Um, we're, we're a bit allergic to the term add-on because what this actually is, is a proposition on its own, topped and tailed okay. wellness, right? So at the top, we have a concept called stay well, which is very simple. You take steps, you earn cash back. Very easy, right? The more you walk, the more you earn, and you're earning this back from your insurance premium. So your insurance company, your insurance product is giving you this money back, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the get well piece, which comes then later, which is if you do fall sick, you have this brilliant health insurance proposition that will take care of you in your bad days, right? And then you've got at the bottom of it all, a live well concept, which has this, this ecosystem of wellness partners that go all the way from mental health um, activations to healthy meals, nutrition, um, you know, um, psychological eating um, patterns. And you get incentivized for engaging with any one of these uh, ecosystem partners. So if you decide, for example, to, to sign up to a Believe Nutrition, right, or to a Coach Hamdan for some life coaching sessions, um, you pay what you would anyways pay to a life coach because you wanted to go to a life coach because you were looking after yourself, and WellX will give you some cash back for doing it. Um, so the idea is through these three concepts, we're able to cover a customer's complete insurance experience um, through wellness, right? So we're mm -hmm. addressing it through, like he said, preventative. It's an a, you know, an age old concept, an apple a day, we're just basically going back to, to our roots where we started. Mm -hmm. Got it. Perfect. Excellent. And this is all strongly powered by the whole AI component as well, isn't it? And that's a huge first as well for the industry here. Yeah, 100%, right? So uh, recommending the right kind of wellness to each, each yeah. individual uh, to optimize their health is is, is where the, uh, the power lies, right? Because there's I mean, well over a thousand different applications that you could potentially use, and there's so much noise in the market. Um, if, if we can, if we can figure out how how to let somebody know what the best thing it is for them to do to optimize their health um, and bring their premiums down in the in the process, then sort of killing many many birds with one stone. Yeah, because the truth is, what's good for me may not be good for him, and what's good for him may not be good for me. Everybody has their own sweet spot, right? When it comes to wellness, and and we want to be able to help them find that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now that you've understood, you know, that sort of customer persona that you're seeking for WellX, how did you uh, go about, uh, you know, letting those customers know about your product and how, how, how did you start your marketing? Um, how did you get them to know the whole proposition? How did you get your first set of customers? So uh, um, I understand that your startup works on the back of partnerships. So how did you get the first, you know, first one off from the ground, off the ground? Right. Okay. Um, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> um, break this up into two pieces, right? So the first part was how we first started, right? Mm -hmm. um, once the product was ready, January is when we started sort of our pre-launch and it was mostly uh, right. through word of mouth, through networks, and we started talking to people and engaging with people. We had a little bit of PR going, uh, mm -hmm. which was a bit overwhelming in terms of response because it's the first time ever in this region that people have seen a different side of insurance, right? So insurance is always about we're always competing on limits. I will cover you up to a million dirhams if you get sick, right? Um, and that's how people have always looked at insurance. And this is the first time an insurance company is saying, you know what, wait, don't fall sick. Um, and if you stay healthy, you keep staying healthy, I'll keep giving you money. And it's like, okay, cool. That, that's awesome, right? So a lot of the initial sort of um, uh, customers that we got come through the doors we're just trying to understand what are you guys trying to do like how mm -hmm. does this even make sense that an insurance company is going to give me money like how do, like, normally I pay an insurance company money right so it was mostly those those non-believers that we were able to convert into believing uh, citizens uh, of the movement right and we, we like to call it a movement because you know mm -hmm. we're trying to drive those resilient communities right so um uh, Webber says this very well, after your parents and um, your family and friends, your insurer should care about you falling sick. Um, but that hasn't really come across very, very uh, clearly or candidly from the insurance perspective, because they're so busy in doing what they're doing. Um, so that's where the initial customer flow came in. And we continued that approach um, of doing a little bit of PR, talking about the concept, signing up with our ecosystem partners, getting them to spread the word. They were echoes around, around the, you know, the, the, the corridors um, within the insurance industry and, and space. We haven't yet started our sort of mass market um, uh, awareness campaigns. We will. That, will, that will come in time. But what we have done is found a new way to market because, you know, going back to what you said earlier about AI, AI only works on scale. You need to have a certain number of community yeah. members before we start, you know, recommending stuff. So we, we thought to ourselves, look, we can keep, and, and everything we did till today, the 1300 members that we have on the 
plan till today um, are people that we had to pretty much bring on board ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, everybody that we have um, on board today was was done primarily by us. And we're like, now, how do we take this and like go next level? Right. We can keep doing, like I said, one policy a day. But how do we take this to the next step? Um, and that's when our b 2 b to c models sort of um, came to life. So um, what we were able to do um, successfully now is get a distribution network that's stronger than um, anything that we, the two of us could have ever been able to achieve on our own. We've been able to sign up with a partner that's taking an insurance partner that's taking us to market through their distribution channels. In fact, we just, we had the signing ceremony today. Um, so early next week, this will be, um, I, I don't know when this particular session section is gonna air, but early next week, our press will be out with that insurer. And um, we're going through their entire network of brokers, sales teams, their digital platforms, whether it's digital sales, um, or offline sales, we're going to be um, spread across the country through their through their um, um, ability to, to take us to market. Um, and that is where we believe we'll be able to achieve immediate sort of scale in the near term. I think the long term and um, the, the long term approach that we're adopting, which we've laid the, the, the seeds for today, will show um, and bear fruit um, in, in the coming years is the concept of embedded insurance, right? And if you see the way the, the bigger players like um, Apple and uh, Netflix and everybody else is, they're embedding their services within um, user experiences, right? So I use yeah. Apple Pay to buy something. I have buy, a buy now, pay later option within that. So it becomes part of that experience. And so through our ecosystem of partners, we started to embed it. And that's how our growth strategy long-term is going to be. We're going to go to the point of sale um, where people are looking for health health and wellness, and we embed this, the, 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 the solution in it. Um, there's a gym, um, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say the name at this point, but that we're signing up with, which will embed our product within their offering. So you'll pay one premium or one amount for a gym membership and an insurance. And that becomes your true embedded insurance. So I, I'm going to look after myself at the gym. I take my insurance from there and, and, and insurance takes care of the gym and the gym takes care of the insurance, you know? So it <laughs> sort of becomes one. Um, right. And you, we've got international inspiration to look at uh, to see how this has been done, so. Right, right. No, absolutely. I think the uh, the embedded uh, you know, insurance uh, space is kind of the holy grail that a lot of insure techs yeah. and insurance companies have tried to uh, uh, you know, kind of chip away. And I think a few of them are making inroads into it. So it's good to see that you guys are also kind of taking that approach. Very good. Uh, so now taking a different angle, uh, probably we'll uh, go into that you know, all-consuming uh, funding process, right? You know, which most founders, including uh, you know me, have gone through this, and we we kind of say, "Hey, I don't want to ever go through that again." But uh, do <laughs> do tell us at a do tell us at a high level uh, how was the process? Uh, what do you think about the current environment in terms of funding? You know, we can see the markets are pretty much kind of depressed in terms of both private and public markets. Any piece right. of advice you want to give to? aspiring uh founders so yeah it's a broad well, basket we are, of we're aspiring, aspiring founders, founders so go for it if you ask <laughs> us, we're, we're happy to take it but you know coming from the banking background i thought it would be it wouldn't be as difficult as it is but what i realized is the pressure on founders and i'm sorry i'm just speaking out of turn here right the pressure on founders and building the business is big enough that raising funding should just not be their job right but yeah. it is so um, so we're Agreed. just gonna have to it, right but but why don't you um um speak to the, I'll, I'll see if i can i mean it's been an it's, it's, it's been an interesting journey um so i mean we, we've been we spoke to spoke to many investors uh we're continuing to build out the product in, in parallel as well i think one of the things we realized after having a few initial conversations is that don't i mean start trying to raise well in advance of your runway ending but don't raise until you have to yeah. Um, and, uh, so, so we've, we've actually taken a step back to, to further build out our product, uh, nice. and because it's, it's just not necessary right now. So, so we're, we're, we're building out the product, uh, we'll get more scale and then we'll see, we'll see what the requirements are a little further down the line. Yeah. yeah. So look, look, the way, the, the way that we see this is, um, and this is, I know something we were talking about very early on, um, the current environment's a bit, uh, uh, um, what's the right word for it? It's a bit sensitive, right? Um, in the sense that there's a lot happening 
And the last thing we want is to take our eye off the prize, right? So for us, while funding is very important and needs to happen at some point, yeah. we want it to happen more organically, more naturally, um, mm -hmm. rather than going out in search for it aggressively. It yeah. cannot be um, our sort of holy grail, right? Or our North Star. It has mm -hmm. to be something we pick up along the way. Yeah, it needs to enable us, right? Like that's, in, that's instead, of, instead of being a target. And you see a lot of the... A lot of posts across, you know, especially on LinkedIn, uh, celebrating the the first round and second round and uh, all, all this kind of stuff. And that's that's great. All the glory associated with that is fantastic. But I feel like that does put uh, a certain amount of pressure on on founders to go and try to raise as much money as possible, more than they potentially need, um, yeah. and put a lot more stress on that while the business suffers, right? And at this stage, at an early stage, it's very important to focus on getting sufficient traction before and let the investors come to you right like yeah. it's uh, i think that that's that's very important uh, so i think i mean we had our initial conversations they were interesting a lot of learnings from them um and uh, and yeah we we just we sort of taken our eye back onto the, the <laughs> onto the ball as well. <laughs> so yeah that it, it's going to it's going to happen eventually as long as we um, keep at it look we're we're like i said very stubborn on the ultimate objective of you know changing the world um, and, and and the way in which we're doing that is very much your we're bringing in a little bit of sort of technical mastery in in uh, in entrepreneurship uh, like the good old days like how how our fathers did it you know take the money that you have and try to try to make a business out of it instead of taking other yeah. people's money but you know what if other people's money comes then it comes but but uh, i think the the idea is um we're at this point of scale right now where we're growing no matter whether the funding happens, doesn't happen. What we want to make sure is that when the funding does come in, we're sort of well situated to be able to make the best use of that money. Uh, yeah. Because the way the markets are right now, you don't know in the next two years, in the next three years, what's going to, I mean, I, I was I was very much uh, at the center of the storm during the recession of 2008. And it was like almost four years of our life, um, mm -hmm. pretty much written off, right? And then, and then the pandemic hit. And I don't know if we're a privileged generation or a lucky generation to see all of this, but anyway, so, so yeah, so a, a lot of stuff has happened and the a lot one, of learnings. Yeah. A lot of learnings. And, but the one thing that we're certain of is that the future is uncertain. So what we need to make, what we need to do as founders today is make sure that our business is sort of recession proof, right? Make sure that yeah. despite what happens in the greater economy, that this business will continue, um, will continue to run either way. And that's what we're kind of focused on, on putting together right now is, is making sure those building blocks are strong enough. Uh, and when the money does come, um, we're sort of well positioned to make the most of it. Yeah, I mean, that kind of uh, ties in with, uh, you know, some of the advice I'm giving uh, to my own uh, startups is, you know, stay frugal, focus on unit economics, uh, shut down all those freemium schemes, start charging. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what, I'm yeah I mean, that's what a business is all about, right? Yeah. I mean, we build business for, for institutions like banks and insurance companies and everybody else. And, and now when it comes to building our own business, we can't do it without, without somebody else's money. I mean, it's, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, Money is always welcome. Just disclaimer. Yeah. I don't know who's going to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> you have money and you want to spend it. <laughs> Which is prudent. If, if, you, want, we, if yeah. you want, we can uh, include this section or cut it out as you wish. <laughs> well, definitely, definitely include it with, with my email address at the top just to make sure that they find their way to the right place. And my bank account number. <laughs> Perfect. Great. I mean, so now you've got your, you know, first set of, you know, customers, you've, you've got the ball rolling there. What has been the response so far from the, you know, consumers um, um, on the product and generally the whole experience itself? And, and, and also what are the trends that you are seeing in the space of wearables, especially linked to health? And how do you think these trends will shape uh, the whole business model, maybe in the future, in the near future itself? Great. Um, so, I mean, our, our, one of the key things we wanted to um, do when we launched Velex was take into account the fact that this is a very price sensitive market, right? So yeah. you can't charge the customer one dirham more. Uh, if you try to, they're gonna, not going to buy your product. So that's why our product costs exactly the same as comparable products in the market. On top of that, we're giving up to two months of premium as, as cashback rewards, right? So the response has been incredible because effectively you're just giving stuff away for free. Um, 
well, not for free. You have to work for it. You have to work, yeah, yeah, uh, customers yeah. work and put in effort on the health side, but uh, the value proposition is very straightforward. So response has been amazing. And in terms of wearables, what's, what's quite, it's, a couple of factors are quite uh, intriguing. So nine, uh, uh, there was a, a Bloomberg report. Arabian business. Arabian business report said that 90% of uh, the UAE population is, is going to be with some sort of wearable uh, by the end of 2020. Five, 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 end of twenty twenty five. Okay, nice. And so proliferation of, of wearables is extremely high uh, in the region. And if you look at other parts of the world, right? So I know like Score has done a product, or Peakry has done a product where they're pre underwriting during onboarding based on the wearables data. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is this trend is starting to emerge because at the end of the day. So far, all underwriting models and actuarial models are based on historical data. Um, and that was predominantly because there's no access to real-time data. But now we do have access to real-time data. So as long as you can augment those models with uh, usable, uh, usable insights, um, then it's just an evolution, a natural evolution of, uh, of more accurate uh, pricing models, right? So yep. that's, that's what we see as being the trend. We, I mean, eventually, our mind your wish is that your premiums are set on a day-to-day -day basis based on how you've behaved on, on, on that day, right? And so right. The, across, across the year, you're, you're paying a flexible premium uh, based, on, based on activity. And uh, that's the eventual goal uh, that we want to get to. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we will. Yeah, I mean, it's too, too soon to say, right? Um, what, the, what the engagements level, levels will be, um, how much of what Weber mentioned we'll be able to do. Um, in the near term, in the long term, for sure, everything that he says is stuff that's been done in other parts of the world. So at some point, we'll, we'll find our right, our sweet spot as well. Um, I think what we're, what we've kind of done right is, like Bev mentioned, if we're pricing it like everybody else, and you're getting something back in return, earning it back, but getting it back, um, you're already sort of creating that that fad. You know, we we live in the UAE, in the region. Um, you know, how they say all that get glitters is gold um, in this yeah. part of the world, right? So um, if, you're, if you're doing something and your top line shows that you're really making a saving by buying into this product, then we've got the ears of the masses, right? Um, that coupled along with on the wearable space, um, we've been privileged enough to um, find a partner in Whoop. Um, and Whoop yeah. is, um, according to Bloomberg, the world's most um, advanced and comprehensive fitness tracker. They also have a very, very big following in the UAE. Um, you know, the Crown Prince is um, an ambassador of the product. He's yeah. on Instagram mm -hmm. every day, he's posting his um, strain recovery scores. Um, so we're kind of doing it the Dubai way, making sure that we touch, you know, homegrown sort of insure tech, born and brought up in the UAE. We're touching on the nerves um, that really have impact on building the community you know getting mm -hmm. people to join the movement because once they're in and they start to see the impact of their own sort of wellness and at some point driving the price of their premium which it actually does from day one right because every time you do well you start getting back money and that eventually brings down the price of your premium so if we're mm -hmm. able to prove it um through constant consistent engagement and by doing so, we're also changing behaviors. Then I think we, we're, you know, we, we've hit the, the nail on the on the head in what we're trying to achieve. And in doing so, you're giving consumers control over an industry where nobody has controlled um, the insurance industry, right? You're giving people, so you're taking the actuaries and saying you guys are really smart, but you're telling consumers you now have a say in what your premiums are going to be. It's not just these actuaries that sit in dark rooms, you know, crunching the numbers that will decide how much you pay. It's yeah. you you have control over your product now. Yeah, and use of wearables in itself, right, does have an impact uh, on an individual's behavior. So just having the information available to you results in uh, some behavioral change. I know I know Whoop itself uh, says that there's a 41% reduction in alcohol consumption, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 20% increase in activity, et cetera. And just by pure usage, right? Like there's nothing, no incentive, nothing uh, attached to it. But now you're setting targets, you're getting people to push for those targets because they're getting rewarded for it. That definitely uh, will have an impact on behavioral change. And uh, if you can achieve the right levels of engagement, that will bring down those claims. Right, right. So, so I mean, uh, I think this is good to hear. And I think uh, one of the, we were talking to Frederick Bisberg from uh, Daman, mm -hmm. and we were just talking about the rewards-based kind of a health, health and wellness scheme. So a couple of pushbacks he gave us, I think, were one is, are the rewards really real time? You know, you know, on a, on a credit card, when you swipe, you get a reward, you're very happy. Is this happening close to the point of action or close to when I took a fitness move? Uh, that was one question he asked. 
uh, or is it at the end of the year when I get something? But from what you say, it's almost like a monthly cash back you mentioned, right? It's, a, it's on a monthly basis. And that's exactly yeah. why, because you can't wait a whole year to get. Well, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And I we think the second gratification generation, if we don't yes. get it now, it's just never going to happen. But we just Absolutely. Absolutely. No and, then the, and I think the second point, uh, which I thought was sensible was um, also sensible was, you know, given the transient nature of UAE. Now, the data collection, you perhaps collect data on a cohort and three, four years down the line, if they have left the country, what data is the insurer using to take decisions? Uh, is a bit of a is a bit of a question mark. I don't know any thoughts on that. I mean, that, that's an that's an interesting take, right? I mean, if you if you think of if you think of a cohort, I mean, we say, I mean, you're not going to have all the 27 year old females vanished from the UAE, right? Like, uh, or you know, you take take that further, all the 25 year old men who weigh between 60 and 70 kilos who uh, have 250 active minutes a day uh, <laughs> or, or or a week, they're not that. Yes, that individual may leave, but the data is still still very much relevant. So I, I'm not, I don't think that is the concern. I think as over time, as we're able to build the parallel between the wellness data and uh, the claims, those models will will continue to grow and develop and still be relevant, irrespective of whether the same individuals that informed the original decision making or in original models are there in the UAE or not. And hey, in three years, when they leave, we hope to be in the country that they go to so that data will follow them wherever they go. <laughs> yeah, that's <brilliant>. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's your market entry strategy right there. <laughs> that's really. Health score follows you around. <laughs> and it's interesting to, to, to mention what you mentioned earlier about Daman. You're absolutely right. You know, we share, we share the reinsurer um, that Daman uses as well uh, on occasion. And they've actually been um, very um, welcoming to the idea, to the, to the extent that they've not just endorsed it, but they're almost like their belief in it is so strong that they're almost like funding it, right? So a very big portion of what incentives we're able to give is funded by them. Um, so I, I feel there's incredible ability if you're able to bring the ecosystem together to be able to deliver the solution that we're doing. I mean, um, it's all well and great that WellX is doing what they're doing and talking about it the way that they're speaking about it because you have these two young kids who feel like they can change the world. But behind us, there's an entire ecosystem of partners that have come together and making it real, right? So you've got the reinsurer, you have the insurer, you have the broker network, um, and then you've got all these wellness ecosystem partners. And it, 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 it's it's the, the ability of being able to connect the dots and bringing them all to a common cause, um, which has enabled us to do what we're able to do today. Yeah. Yeah. So Great. hats off to the community. No, that's that's awesome. You know, so you guys spoke briefly just now about the whole uh, role of data as well in, into into uh, the customer mix and the underwriting mix itself. Tell us what is the role um, um, the whole the whole data uh, crunching plays in Wellex's you know, business model now. How do you use them to deliver value to your users, to your business partners? And and last but not the least, but you know, how how do you deal with the whole important issue of data privacy itself? Well, I tell you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's off top go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go? Um, yeah. So of course, like look, get, gathering customer consent um, yeah. is, is is extremely important, right? And so yes. a customer always has to provide consent yes. in order to be able to earn earn the rewards. Um, so whenever they do buy a policy or sign up to the applications, uh, they do they do provide consent. Beyond that, I think. There's numerous studies, right? There was an extensive study that said what said 70% of uh, millennials and younger generations are willing to share their uh, activity data in order to get better premiums. Um, we haven't seen any concerns yet uh, on an individual level uh, with uh, people sharing, you know, how many steps they're taking or these type of things to be able to uh, to be able to get some rewards and cash incentives. Um, the, the the role data plays is is it's very uh, interesting, right? Because so our, our our thought process is that you can't rely on one data source and one type of data to be able to inform a holistic wellness uh, approach, right? So we, yeah. we've integrated with well over 13 partners at this stage and sort of that's, that's growing oh. on a week, weekly basis. And uh, the, the idea is that we need a whole breadth and depth of data to be able to get the, the insights that we need uh, and to be able to show those parallels of uh, reduced claims um, because just steps is, is not enough, um, just active minutes is not enough. 
purely mental wellness is not enough, but uh, a combination of all those uh, all those factors is is what will play a role. Of course, the customer gets to choose what they want to share, what they don't want to share, but but the rewards are linked to that. And uh, and eventually, what we believe is, as long as the customer is monetizing on their own data, which they are in this case, uh, I think it's 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 a fair proposition. You know, one of the corporates that we were um, presenting to very early on in our journey um, mentioned to us, and, and you know, um, data privacy at large institutions is so much more sort of, you know, sensitive. You can't even talk about it, right? But he was like, this is the first time I've seen an entity specifically within the insurance space coming and talking to us about sharing data for bottom line impactability. Normally, it's us asking them for data, and, and they either refuse to give it or inflate it and give it back to us. Um, but this is the first time, yeah, I like that smile. But this is the first time that that um, you're telling us you will collect data from us and help us um, with our bottom lines. And, and that's huge, right? If you're able to give people savings um, in a space where they had already given it up, um, very, very long time ago, because, you know, with, with insurance, medical inflation takes your premiums up every year. It's just, you know, something that you know for certain that will happen is your insurance premium will go up as you get older, right? Or as your um, group gets larger or whatever. But this is this, this you know, certain element of control. So it's almost like, yes, you're monetizing on data from a WellX standpoint, right? Um, it's almost like you're buying data, but, but from a customer standpoint, you're taking your data and you're earning from it. Whereas everywhere else you start spreading your data, right? You go on Instagram and you like a post, you're giving your data away for free. You're sharing with somebody else what you like at, with no return on investment, right? Uh, on the contrary, they start bombarding you with ads and all of a sudden they're making more money from you. Um, yeah. But here you're actually taking your data and making money from it, right? By, by um, remaining healthy. So it, it, it has an impact and there are studies to show it, like I mentioned, the Accenture one and others. Yeah, yeah. So you, you're not, you're not, uh, you take care of the data and you're not finding any pushback in terms of usage from your customers is what I'm hearing. That's, that's great. Uh, qu question, and I think probably you've answered this, uh, but I should ask this is, you know, are you going to be very focused on uh, health as a segment or do you see yourself diversifying? After all, that whole data engine is a, is a, yeah. is something you can export to other lines of businesses as well, right? 100%. Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, look, the obvious next product to add is life. Uh, just because in terms of the preventative ecosystem, uh, it's just it's the same. Um, and if you see the low, the sort of large competition or inspiration that we have internationally, life and health uh, products sort of go well together. Um, yeah. Beyond that, we'll see. But uh, from from a roadmap perspective, I think that that's big enough uh, of a of a chunk to tackle. Oh, totally, yes, yeah. absolutely, indeed, yeah. indeed. indeed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would not have been surprised if you if you had said no, it's just going to be health, just simply because of the focus that gives you. Yeah. Uh, but here in this case, uh, that data does easily lend to a life kind of a situation as well. Yeah. I can I can see yeah. that life yeah. critical illness that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Certainly. Employee benefits. <laughs> Employee, oh yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. So you know, this is this has been so great to you know have a chat with you both. It's it's just wonderful, um, you know, to get all sorts of startup insights and you know, and it's just just the energy is palpable. Uh, before we end, is there a message that you'd like to send to anyone from this industry? Um, you know, in in the UAE, it could be a personal one, it could be a business one. Um, floor is all yours. Um, wow, that got us by surprise. <laughs> I'd like to thank my mom and my dad. And <laughs> yes, I would. I would. <laughs> and your dad? I, uh, <laughs> like I just want a Grammy, but um, no, I think look, look, it's um, it's 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 been real. Um, getting to where we are today has not been without its fair share of um, uh, you know, incredible moments as well as really um, difficult sort of, um, you know, uh let's figure this out kind of moments right but i think if if anyone is to look at coming down a path um on which we have uh, chosen right leaving a very sort of successful job to try uh, and change the world i think it's a matter of passion being passionate about what it is that you're trying to achieve uh, and persistence because without grit like you're nowhere in this space this this is this is a very sort of grueling space but the impact that you're able to make at the end is that light at the end of the tunnel is so freaking bright 
um, you just have to, you know, main, keep your focus on being able to get there. Um, and, and then once you're there, then hopefully when we're there, it'll all be worth it. And uh, just, just for the sort of entire industry standpoint, I think more than 50% of the people we've spoken to uh, from the industry are extremely receptive to change, extremely forward-looking and extremely excited about, you know, changing the industry, improving it, delivering more value to customers. Um, and if it's, whether it's the infrastructure or whether it's uh, the opportunity that, uh, that provides them the base to help grow and expand uh, the horizons of the entire industry, I think, uh, I think that's changing and that's improving and that, and we'll see a lot of more innovation coming in from the carriers themselves, not just from startups. Absolutely. Yeah. And if anybody's got money, we're here. My email address is on the green screen behind you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we should get your, uh, <laughs> yeah, we should get your contacts for the, you know, for the show notes and we, we will have a link there for sure. <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll constantly put that out if you guys want. Con that. Contact us for, for you know if you want to fund us, please. <laughs> you want to get in on a unicorn so early on? <laughs> Absolutely. So wish you guys so much. all the best. Been real. This was fantastic. Very good, guys. Thank, Thank you. Right. You have a good time. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.